welcome to my mommy's podcast. This podcast is brought to you by BLDG Active Skin Repair Products. From diaper rash to knee scrapes and sunburns, with families, there's always something skin-related going on. And Active Skin Repair has a unique solution. They harness the power of the human body by replicating the same molecule your white blood cells produce to create a natural antimicrobial. This fights off foreign organisms like bacteria, fungi, and viruses, and helps support your body's natural healing process of soothing skin irritations. I'm a big fan of anything that works with the body's natural processes, and this is the most natural one I have found. It's an all-in-one, three-ounce solution that you can use in place of all kinds of toxic first aid and sanitizing products like neosporin, peroxide, and alcohol. And In addition, unlike other plant-based balms, Active Skin Repair's hero ingredient, HOCI, is backed by years of scientific and clinical research using the same FDA-cleared medical-grade molecule used in hospitals worldwide. They produce theirs in California in an ISO-certified clean room using a proprietary formulation to make sure that you get the highest grade product available. I've also found in testing this that my kids really prefer this to any other type of product because it seems much more comfortable and doesn't seem to cause the initial stinging or irritation. So it's been a great product at our home. You can learn more by going to wellnessmama.com forward slash go forward slash active. That's wellnessmama.com forward slash go forward slash active, A-C-T-I-V-E. This podcast is brought to you by Paleo Valley. They have been my go-to source for grass-fed beef sticks for years, and I'm really loving their bone broth protein these days as well. It's made from 100% grass-fed and grass-finished cows that have never been given antibiotics, steroids, or hormones, so those compounds don't end up in the final product. They're also made from bones and not hides. See, many companies use the hides of animals to make protein powders because it's cheaper. And when collagen is sourced from the animal skin, we miss out on the extra nutrients and the restorative benefits of the bones. Another important thing that sets them apart, they are not processed with high heat. And this is important because high heat processing can denature and coagulate the protein, making it harder for the body to absorb and use. Extreme temperatures can also destroy more heat sensitive amino acids and other nutrients or make the protein resistant to our digestive enzymes, which decreases absorption. So even if you're taking these, you may not be getting all of the benefit. Paleo Valley also third party tests their bone broth protein powder for pesticides, herbicides and heavy metals to make sure that they're safe and their protein powder does not have any smell or taste. So it's easy to add to just about everything. You can check it out and learn more about this and all of their products by going to paleovalley.com forward slash mama to save 15%. Again, that's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com slash M-A-M-A for 15% off. Hello, and welcome to the Wellness Mama podcast. I'm Katie from wellnessmama.com and wellness.com. That's wellness with an E on the end. It's my personal care line. This podcast is all about flow states. You know that feeling when everything just lines up and you're able to get a ton of work done or you're in intense creativity or maybe a sport or physical activity and you're just in the zone? That's what we're talking about today, and it's called Flow States and a lot of research. I'm here with Rian Doris, who is the co-founder and CEO of the Flow Research Collective. They've done a lot of work on researching the neurobiology and the chemistry of what's happening in these states, and then also applying that research to people in various walks of life to make people more effective at the things that they're doing, especially in a work capacity. But we take a really fun deviation into the educational side of this and how we as parents can help nurture our kids into having a high performance mindset and a solid foundation for life using things like flow states and how kids are naturally even better about this than we are so we can learn from them due to some really cool research about their prefrontal cortex and their ability to drop into flow states. It's a fascinating episode that takes a lot of really interesting twists and turns. So let's join Rian. Rian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Katie. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm excited to go deep on the topic of flow and especially applying this to ourselves and our families. But before we get to that, I have a research note that you ate the same thing for two years and I have to hear this story. (laughs) That's good. That's good research. Um, Yes, I love I love routines. Personally, I love being uh, very consistent and I love 
automating things that I don't care that much about me personally, at least. And one of those things is, is food. I'm not necessarily a foodie. So I, I uh, for one intensive work period over two years, just standardized exactly what I ate and uh, managed to stick to it for, for a fairly long period of time to free up headspace and time and energy to be able to do the things that, that I cared more about. Um, and also the, th- the, the, the daily routine I had, the diet I was sticking to was, was delicious. So it wasn't too hard. What were you eating? That's fascinating. <laughs> if you really want me, want me to give you the breakdown, I'm happy, but it was, uh, so I was on a keto diet, which, which makes it important to be consistent because they're crazy strict. I would eat every day. I would eat two packets of um, nuts, cashews, and almonds. I would eat 500 grams of, of minced beef, grass-fed Irish minced beef, two avocados, six eggs, a bar of 85% dark chocolate, and uh, a little bit of fried um, broccoli and, and some greens. That was pretty much it daily, one meal a day for two years. So that was the routine. Wow. Well, that's impressive to stick to it for that long. Fascinating. So this episode is about the topic of flow, which I've touched on before with Stephen Kotler, who we talked about briefly before we jumped in. I really, really love him and his work. And I know that uh, you guys work together on the Flow Collective. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to go deep on this because I think there's so many springboards from my first conversation with him, which I'll link to if you guys haven't heard it. Um, But to start broad, can you kind of just give us an overview of when we say the word flow, what we mean? Sure. Yeah. Always helpful to define it. So most people know of flow as being in the zone. When you hear someone say that, you know, I managed to get into the zone at work today, or I was out biking and I, you know, I got into state or I got into a groove. Generally, they're referring to getting into a flow state. And it's more technically defined as an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. And then the descriptive definition is that flow occurs when action and awareness merge time dilates so often minutes go by in in what feels like a longer period of time and then long periods of time go by in what feels like moments so you spend three hours in an afternoon writing for example and you look up check the time and it feels like you've only been writing for a few a few minutes so that's what a flow state is, a state of, of optimal performance and total immersion in the task at hand. Is there, are there differences happening neurobiologically when we're talking about a flow state? I mean, I certainly I've had that experience and felt that difference in mind, mindset and focus and being able to work, but are there actual physiological changes happening as well? Yeah, it's a great question. One of the questions that we get quite a lot is, what's the difference between flow and focus? Isn't focus you know, and just the same, the same thing. What's, what's actually the difference. And the difference is that first off flow often occurs after a period of uninterrupted focus. So the way, the way that I like to describe it is that attention involves directing your awareness to a specific focal point. When you hold that attention for an extended period of time, we call that focus. And often when you persistently focus, you're able to shift state and get into what we call a flow state. So it kind of becomes attention, focus, flow. And there are a number of physiological shifts that are distinct between a flow state and just being focused on something without being in flow. And those shifts occur across our neurochemistry. So there's there's different neurochemistry that shows up. Those shifts are measurable from a neuroelectric perspective. So there's, there's a shift in, in sort of our, our brainwave state. And then those shifts are also apparent in terms of experience, in terms of what it actually qualitatively feels like versus just simply being focused. So for example, the, the time dilation that I, that I mentioned. Neurochemically, we believe at least, the research is largely out, we believe that anandamide, dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, and norepinephrine are all present um, during a flow state. And that is, that is distinct from a normal state of, of focus, so to speak. And I know you guys have done a lot of research on some of these parts of understanding what's happening in a flow state and also in the practical application of how the, this affects our lives. And I think that's a really important point to delve into because 
I would guess most people listening have had the experience of that timeless flow state where everything is just clicking into place and you totally lose track of time. I've had it happen with writing. I've had it happen with art and creative pursuits and also with like really fun physical activities. Um, but it also seems like, I think a lot of us would maybe say we've had that experience, but it's kind of elusive. It's not something we can just kind of find or turn on at will. And I think you guys have done some interesting research around this area as well. Is that right? Yes. Not necessarily research, but I would say our, our primary focus as a, as a company, as an organization, at least from a training perspective, is in helping people take this elusive, sporadic, state that has immense benefits to it that we all know of and have experienced and want more of and turn it into something that is accessible with consistency and on demand and in a way that we can actually predict or uh, predict it at least as much as possible. So the, the goal is to take flow from being this elusive thing that sometimes shows up to making it a consistent thing that we can drive ourselves into so that we can get sustained peak performance and so that optimal performance and flow is, is not a matter of, of luck or chance, but rather a matter of, of circumstance. Um, and one of the things that's important to clarify is that accessing flow like this is not mechanistic. It's probabilistic. So people often ask, oh, what's the push button thing I need to do to drop into flow right now? or be able to, to be able to drop into flow all the time. And it's, it's not, unfortunately, quite as simple as that. Rather, it's, it's probabilistic. There are stacks of things you can do that are going to greatly improve your likelihood of accessing flow, but it's never going to be 100% consistent. That makes sense. And an important distinction, although it does seem in conversations I've had with really elite performers, whether that be high-level athletes or um, elite performers in other realms, they do seem to have developed the ability to do that more often or somewhat more reliably. I, I guess it makes sense, not completely at, at will, but what are some of the, the factors that come into play there? Yeah, well, that's a, just a really important point in and of itself. And that's the fundamental paradigm shift, which is that getting into a flow state is in and of itself a skill set that you can get better at. People often think of skills and it's 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 very apparent that you can get better at a certain skill people know that if they practice learning a language they'll get better or if they practice surfing they'll get better or x y or z but often we don't realize that the actual state that sits underneath these skills is also something that we can actually get better at manufacturing for ourselves we actually were interviewing myself and steven we're interviewing laird hamilton the big wave surfer last week and he was talking about the fact that over, over his career, his ability to drive himself into the zone with consistency has constantly improved and he can get himself into that state very, very rapidly now. So there's, there's definitely the ability, I think, to, to improve one's own skill at driving themselves into a state of optimal performance. And there's a number of different factors to that. The first is understanding what triggers exist for flow in general for for all people and we can talk about those a little bit and then the second thing is going to be individualistic we often talk about running end to one experiments or running experiments where you know you are the only one where that may apply to and that's a really important piece of it as well is is knowing your own individual quirks the things that you need to have in place as an individual to be able to get into get into the zone. So it's both understanding what works for everyone and then understanding what works for you and finding a, a nice balance between those. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I say that a lot in relation to the more physical aspects of nutrition and health too, is I can, everything is a guideline because we're so individualized that at the end of the day, I think the N equals one experiments get discounted, but for each of us individually, those are the most important ones because it doesn't actually matter what the collective research says if something does or doesn't work for you. And so I'm a big proponent of personalization in every area of health and right. it makes complete sense that that would apply very directly here as well. You mentioned triggers. Let's delve into some of those because I would guess maybe, for instance, um, like Stephen wrote about, I believe it was the rise of Superman about extreme athletes being able to do this more reliably. So I would wonder if there's maybe an adrenaline component or something going on um, there. But I would guess that most people on a daily basis aren't going to want to use adrenaline and extreme sports as their triggers. So let's talk about triggers and how we can start to identify those. Sure. 
Yeah. So the first thing to note is that flow states do have triggers, which are preconditions that are going to increase the likelihood that we'll be able to get into a flow state. And there are a number of different categories of triggers. There are environmental triggers, there are psychological triggers, there's group triggers that show up when we're interacting with others. Now, what's interesting about extreme athletes and certain sports, you mentioned, for example, that you get into flow when engaged in creative activities often. What's interesting about certain activities is that they naturally or inherently have lots of flow triggers baked into them, which means that getting into flow, doing those activities alone is much more likely. And an example of that is, is surfing, just to take an example of an extreme sport. So within surfing, there is complexity, there's unpredictability, there's risk, there's challenge, there's feedback, because you're either you know, surfing the wave or you're not, you know, you know how well you're doing at any given point. And similar, similarly with, with creative activities, you see a lot of those sorts of variables show up within the activity itself, which makes those activities inherently very conducive to flow. But what we can also do is identify the triggers that show up in those activities and then take them out of those activities and put them into activities that tend to be less naturally conducive to flow which for a lot of people is the case with their, their work. So that's one of the things we help people do is take those triggers out of certain activities and embed them in activities that they don't naturally show up in. And one example that's a big trigger for flow is the challenge skills balance, which you may have, you may have heard of before, which is the idea that flow shows up at the sweet spot between challenge and skill within an activity. So we want to be engaged in an activity that is causing us to stretch, but not snap. And if the activity is too difficult relative to our skill level, we'll get propelled into a state of over arousal and anxiety. If the activity is not difficult enough relative to our skill level, we'll drop down into a state of understimulation and boredom and flow sits right at the sweet spot between challenge and skill level where the challenge level just slightly outstrips your existing your existing skill level so that's one example of a of a trigger for flow that that we can actually use within any activity really you can gauge and tune the challenge skills balance within any activity one of the ways that we have our clients do that within their work is by using time if you allot yourself more time to a certain task that task within the context of which you're completing it becomes easier because you've got more resources with which to complete that task. You've got more time to do it. On the contrary, if you've got a really boring mundane activity, giving yourself an artificial sense of urgency and reducing the time allotment that you're giving yourself to do that thing is going to increase the challenge level, which can be helpful for getting to flow if the activity you're doing is boring, like doing your taxes or something like that. Got it. So that would apply to any activity, not just physical activities. You could apply this in, for instance, maybe school settings for kids, work settings for adults. Um, and it really sounds like any task that you would complete. Yeah. Interestingly, in, in school settings, I mean, I think one of the challenges with, with education and one of the reasons that a, a low student to teacher ratio is always the goal and is always appealing is so that you can so that the teacher can tune the challenge skill level to have it be optimal. Because if you've got one teacher and 40 students and they all have differing skill or ability levels with respect to a certain task or topic, a lot of them are going to be finding the material that they're covering either too hard or too easy. And they're not going to be in that sweet spot for flow. Whereas when you've got as close to possible as a one-to-one teacher to student ratio, the teacher can play the role of helping the student get that optimal challenge skills balance by going at a certain pace, for example, that is good for the student to be able to keep up with and thus more conducive to flow. So there's a lot of homeschooling families that listen to this podcast as well. Um, I homeschool my kids and I'm intensively working right now on something called Institute, which is essentially an uncurriculum, um, but nice. focus very much on the mindset and the practical application and minimizing the book work as much as possible. And so I'm really curious, are there special ways we can, when we have that much control over the educational environment, 
both the physical environment that we're educating in and the time constraints related to it, what are some of the ways that we could best set up education to really help maximize that for our kids? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. It's interesting. I was actually listening to an interview with Elon Musk um, earlier this week, and he was saying, why, why is education, why is learning not more entertaining for kids than a video game? And I think that's, it's, it's a great question. You know, why is doing calculus not more fun than playing Fortnite? And it, sh- it should be because it matters more to those kids' lives than playing, than playing, uh, than playing Fortnite. But we, have, we just haven't got there yet, gotten there yet with education. The reason, the reason that playing Fortnite or whatever video game it is, is more fun generally is because it is creating a flow state. It's creating a flow state that is inherently pleasurable and engaging and meaningful and is an end in and of itself, whereas doing calculus often is, is, is very far from that. But in terms of what can help drive, drive flow within education, one of the big things is autonomy. So we, we pay attention to those things that we, that we care about and that we choose to pay attention to. And if we don't have the autonomy to choose what we're learning about or looking at, then our ability to pay attention declines. Another important thing is having, and this is related to autonomy, but it's going, it's going macro to micro. So often when, when you start a topic with a, with a macro perspective, a big, broad perspective, like let's say it's the context is trying to build a business related to something you're, you know, you're immensely passionate about. Then from within that macro context, dropping down to more micro specific things like learning about, you know, how to do accounting, all of a sudden that gets infused with meaning and with purpose and with significance because of the fact that it is a means to a greater end. And that's an important thing just in education in general, I think is creating these macro contexts, whether it's using stories or projects or challenges, and then having the, 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 the more dull things be a means to that end rather than an end in itself. And the conventional education system, I think in many ways, at least when I was in school just did a horrendous job of that they just they throw trigonometry at you rather than telling you to build a a bridge project for example and then you having to learn trigonometry as part of that fun overarching project so i think that's another important piece yeah that and i i wonder if have you guys found any information about if kids are naturally a little bit better at triggering these states if given these tools, because it seems like kids do have a unique ability, especially when I watch my really younger ones to drop into that kind of time dilation idea and like immerse in a project. And it seems like they can stay in that balanced state for a lot longer when they're given enough tools and stimulation to get into that fun part of it. Are kids, because of their maybe higher theta and developing brain chemistry, are they able to do this more easily? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. So interestingly, one of the things we believe happens in a flow state is called transient hypofrontality, uh, which essentially refers to the slight deact- deactivation or downregulation of the prefrontal cortex. And that's what creates the reduction in sense of self where, you know, you lose yourself in the activity and also the, the time dilation that you mentioned. And kids, by default of sheer you know, development of their biology have less developed prefrontal cortexes. And so they are actually closer at a baseline level to a flow state all the time, which is one of the reasons I think the kids engage in play and play is very, very much so related to related to flow. One of the interesting things about play and the definition of play is, is really interesting. And one of the key things about the definition of play is that it is not goal oriented. And flow, one of the cool things about flow is that it is reported in the research to be worthwhile as an end in itself. The state itself feels good enough to be its own reward. We don't need to get into flow just to produce some other result. We want to get into flow just because. And it's similar with play. Play is fun just because. It's not necessarily just about achieving some you know, end result goal. In that sense, are there elements of play that, because I think that's a thing that kids are naturally, 
given more space and freedom and encouraged to do. And it's a thing that's often lost as we get older. And you saying that I wonder, is play a useful trigger? And is that also an element of why these sports make it potentially easier to fall into a flow state? I think so. Yeah, I think so for sure. And um, yeah, one of the interesting things about play and about kids in general is that inherently within play, there is not that much self judgment uh, and, and the level of self criticism declines. And that's one of the reasons we believe that creativity increases in flow, because when you're in a flow state, that sense of self, the nagging defeatist inner dialogue that's telling you you're not good enough and comparing you to others that quietens down and goes offline because of transient hyperfrontality. And so we're less critical of ourselves, which is assumed to open up creative possibility because we judge less and do more or play more. So I think for sure, that's one of the, that's one of the drivers of a flow and creativity within flow. Is incorporating more play a thing that you actively encourage adults to do and to like reinvigorate as well? And if so, what would be some good kind of springboards for getting back to that for those of us who have kind of thought of ourselves as grown out of that? Yeah, it is actually one of the things we encourage people to do, believe it or not. Um, so the way we describe it is, is that you want to have a primary and a secondary flow activity outside of your work generally. And this actually goes back to the point that getting into flow is a skill in and of itself that you can develop and get better at. And uh, as Laird Hamilton was mentioning over the years, he's gotten better and better at getting into flow. And so under that principle, the more flow you get, the more flow you're likely to get. If you're able to get into flow doing X, you're going to be more, more able to get into flow doing Y because you're developing the overall skill of getting yourself into that state. So what we have people generally do is identify a, a primary and a secondary flow activity. And that activity is essentially play of whatever one you know decides their play to be. It might be snowboarding. It might be surfing. It might be uh, painting. It might be playing a musical instrument. It might be um, improv rap. It might be, you know, comedy. It might be, it might be any number of things, but it's usually going to be some sort of play-like activity that's very conducive to flow. And what we find anecdotally is that when people reboot their ability to get into flow through those sorts of activities, that transfers to their professional life and they're more easily able to access these states in a, in a professional capacity. Stephen has this great story about speaking with Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who's sort of the godfather of flow and the original researcher um, on the topic who actually coined the term flow. And he was telling Stephen to diversify his primary and secondary flow activities. Stephen was talking to him about the fact that he gets into flow mainly while skiing. And that that's Stephen's biggest flow activity. And that transfers into his writing, which is, is his professional role. And Csikszentmihalyi was telling him to make sure now, before he gets too old, to take up another form of play or another, another flow activity um, that does not require physical exertion. Because there's going to come a time where Stephen is potentially you know, too old to be able to ski or at least to be able to ski as frequently as he does now. And if he does not develop another activity or another, another gateway into flow, there's risk of being, of being locked out of flow at that point and then being able to access the state less frequently. So it's really important to have multiple avenues, multiple forms of play and multiple avenues into a flow state so that you're not solely dependent on one. And interestingly, we, we get a lot of clients who are ex-athletes and who are ex, um, ex-military. And this is one of the biggest challenges they have is that they were professional athletes and their whole life was centered around flow, whether it was playing football or basketball or whatever it may be. And then their career ends or they get injured or whatever the case may be. And there's this just gaping hole in their experience of life. And they then realize, oh, wait a second, I was spending X number of hours a week in flow. And now I'm spending, you know, zero hours a week in flow. And so one of the things we have them do is, is reboot their ability to access flow by getting another activity like that on board. And it's same often for military, military folks as well. Even, even um, other service providers like firefighters get very, very high levels of flow. And then when that, when that career ends or goes away, there's this lack of it. So 
rebuilding it in through through play intentionally is a really important piece of of being able to access it more consistently within within your professional life and just getting the general benefits that come with flow as well. Can you share some examples of maybe non-physical sport related activities? Because there are a lot of people listening, especially as moms, if you're especially they're pregnant or in certain phases, those are discouraged. Um, or for people like you mentioned who have maybe are in a phase of life where they can't do that or they're injured, what would be some ways of, or maybe like a roadmap for starting to find those flow activities? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. So interestingly, there was some research done it was in the late late 90s or early 2000s that actually found that the highest flow activity was graffiti, which is really interesting. One of the reasons for that, I believe, is the risk involved. There's inherent risk when doing graffiti because of the fact that it's illegal. And then there's all the other, the other creative triggers within graffiti, obviously, because it's a creative act. The point being, though, that, that physical, physical paths into flow are absolutely not the only ones you can get into flow socially you can get into flow creatively you can get into flow cognitively and you can get into flow physically so socially one of the one of the examples i mentioned there was you know improv improv rap another example is public speaking another example is stand up comedy but also other examples that are just more common are getting into flow within conversation with a, with a close friend, getting into flow, brainstorming with a group at work, getting into flow, um, you know, building a startup with a team that you're close with and on board with. And we can talk through some of the group flow triggers as well that drive flow within the, these contexts, if you'd like. Um, and then with, with respect to creativity, there's a whole host of different activities there as well. Everything from singing to painting to dancing, which obviously is on the, on the verge of kind of physical and creative um, through to, you know, making pottery through to um, all sorts of different creative activities. The list is, the list is long. And again, the end to one piece applies here. If you find that you get into flow very well doing a certain thing, that's, that's totally, you know, that's totally fine and great. And then you can also get into flow cognitively. People find that they get into flow uh, reading or thinking about philosophy, for example, or coding is a big one or, or solving challenges and doing Sudoku. Uh, and then obviously there's a whole host of, of physical activities that can drive oneself into flow as well. But I, I think the point there is that there, there are different, there are different categories of activities that you can get into flow within and it's important to, to find those that are just most suitable to where you're at right now and also most conducive to flow for you. For some people, they find their deepest flow states socially. For some people, they find their deepest flow states cognitively. Depends on, on you as an individual as well. So it's worth just experimenting with that. I definitely have noticed for me, the cognitive ones seem to be easier and so I'm constantly looking for mind puzzles or chess or right. um, like hard challenging tests, things like that. Um, but I also have been talking about from the physical and mental health perspective, the importance of community for a really long time on this podcast and how like mm. truly that is one of the best things we can do for our health. I think it's one of the main reasons why blue zones are blue zones. It's not the right. diet. It's because they have very, very strong community. And I've talked about how, you know, it's more important to have strong community and relationships than it is even to exercise or quit smoking. When you look at it on a biological level. So I'd love to delve into some of those group flow triggers because that's, I think, a really cool way if you can nurture community and also get into a state of flow, you get that double benefit there. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's interesting on the, on the community front, belonging specifically is, is extremely important. You use the word community, which, which signifies that. But what we find sometimes within our clients is that they'll try and, they'll try and get that need met by just increasing social time or social contact, but that's distinct from belonging. If you are in contact with lots of different people all day long, but there's no overarching sense of belonging to a community because those individual people you're in contact with don't know each other, for example, that does not necessarily get your belonging needs met. So community specifically is actually a really, really important piece of that versus just simply the sheer quantity of social contact. So the group flow triggers are, 
are, are really interesting. A lot of them come out of work done by Keith Sawyer, who's a University of North Carolina psychologist. He wrote a great book called Group Genius. And uh, I'll run through some of the different group flow triggers. So the first one is shared goals. So having shared goals, which is fairly straightforward, is extremely important to be able to get in the flow. And you can think of that with respect to sports teams. You can think of that with respect to the military. You know, there's a, there's a group going out on a, on a mission that, uh, that they're all aligned on. You can think of that both in terms of what blocks flow and what drives flow within organizations and startups. If there is misalignment on what the goal is and what the actual objective at hand is within a team in a professional context, the likelihood of flow occurring is significantly lower. And it's one of the reasons that a lot of business gurus and things like that emphasize getting in sync as such an important thing, because if you're not in sync and you're not all aligned on what the goal is, you're you know not going to be able to get in the flow together as a group. Another one is uh, equal equal participation. So that's an important piece of getting into flow as a group, which is all having kind of a related level of contribution to whatever the task at hand is. If some people are engaged and some people are disengaged or less engaged. That's going to that's gonna throw off your ability to get into flow as a group. Uh, another interesting one is shared skill level. And if, if you've ever been on a team with someone who is either, you know, infinitely more competent than you are and speaking at, you know, five times the rate that you can comprehend or someone who can't keep up, you can feel the tension that emerges when skill levels are are distinct and and lacking and that's one of the other reasons that it's so important within teams to to bring on talent that is you know as good or better than the current team because if there's different skill levels you're going to block the team from getting into flow together and one of the biggest frustrations and drivers of attrition within teams is that the the team was not, you know, quote unquote, at the level that that individual who left the company felt they were at. And it can be an immense source of frustration for, for people within teams when, when other people on the, on the team are just not, not able to keep up or just not able to operate and move at the same level that, that someone else is. So that's another big one. That, um, yeah, writing down notes, that's helpful as a business owner and also as a parent in nurturing like kind of the family as a team. Right. Um, and also to use myself, I'm happy to be the guinea pig here. But on a personal level, I remember in the early phases of growing Wellness Mama that it was fun because it was probably surfing that edge of challenge and skill. And I was constantly challenged. And then as things have grown and I've created systems for everything, it was much harder to get in that flow state. And it felt much more kind of like a job versus a fun challenge and activity. Interesting. Um, and so I've kind of instinctively tried to figure out ways to reactivate that. And I have done things like voice lessons or I'm right now playing calculus just for fun or doing stand-up comedy um, to kind of reinvigorate the creativity side of that. But I'm curious if you have any tips. I'd love to make that more intentional of being able to kind of find my flow triggers and then transfer that into business and parenting as well. Yeah. One of the, one of the reasons that in the early stages startups are so conducive to flow is risk risk level is higher there's 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 social risk that's being taken with respect to the to the startup itself someone's venturing out into the unknown and putting their name behind something that's not yet determined to be successful and then there's often financial risk and risk is a driver for flow so when that risk goes away and a company is consolidated often flow decreases as well so bringing in that risk in in certain ways by continuing to push the edge or continuing to push for for growth and improvement can be a driver of flow and that that also relates to the challenge skills balance often at an earlier stage the individuals in a company are pushing into their edge and leaning into the edge of their comfort zone, which often correlates with having the sweet spot between challenge and skill that drives flow. And then they hit a certain threshold where the company's consolidated or built and either they pull back and are no longer in the sweet spot for, for flow with respect to the, the challenge level of what they're engaged in, or they're doing the same thing, but they are, more skilled because of being more experienced and so to compensate for that you got to push harder and, and set bigger larger goals 
Another important piece is feedback. And feedback is one of, is a massive trigger for flow. It's often baked into video games. And, you know, so you can think of the example I was using earlier was Fortnite. When you do something in Fortnite, you get all sorts of feedback and you get it immediately. The faster you get the feedback from having taken an action, the more conducive that feedback is to flow. So within a video game, you take an action like shooting a bad guy and your remote controller vibrates. You hear noises on the screen, points go up and uh, you know something flashes across the screen or whatever the case may be. And that feedback is very conducive to flow. Similarly, at an early stage for often, often for startups, the quantity of feedback they're getting is enormous. They're talking to users or customers. They are seeing whether the direction they're going with respect to their product suite is working or not. They're starting to you know, hit certain KPIs, which is a form of feedback from their actions. And the quantity of that feedback is, is large and the speed at which they're getting it is large as well. And then often over time, as we build a team and become bigger, we become more removed from that, that feedback, whether it's clients or whether it's you know, doing the work yourself and then seeing how that work gets received within the business, that often declines. So adding feedback mechanisms back in for yourself as an owner um, can be just a really helpful, important way of, of doing that, that I think is, yeah, is, is important. Those are all amazing tips. I was over here taking notes while you were talking. Um, I also, from one of the questions I love to ask in the research phase is if you could give a TED talk, what would it be on? And you mentioned the idea of thinking big, which I think also like is a very much a dovetailed piece of the idea of flow states and what you just mentioned about setting big goals. It's also something that's very top of mind for me, both in business and also now that my kids are getting older and basically how do I nurture this in them and help them develop a high performance mindset. So I would love uh, any specific advice you have related to that because I think this is also universally applicable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think just understanding very simply that the reason belief is so important is because belief is a predicate for actions that you will take. So often people poo-poo the secret or the law of attraction or all these different things that, that emphasize belief. And you got to believe. And if you, you know, if you believe you, you can achieve whatever you believe, and there's that, that whole self-help world dedicated to belief that, that often gets discarded. And one of the reasons it gets discarded is because people emphasize that belief alone is not enough, which is absolutely true. However, the valuable thing in that world is that belief is a predicate for action. If you don't believe that it's possible to create a New York Times bestselling book, you are blocking yourself from the actions that would potentially make it possible to create a New York Times bestselling book. If you don't believe that you can build a hundred million dollar company, you are going to block yourself from the actions that would potentially make it possible to build a hundred million dollar company. So that the belief is a predicate and a filter for the actions that you would potentially take. And the actions that you would take are the things that are going to ultimately create that, you know, end result, that thing that you actually want. So if you don't think big enough, and if you don't actually believe something is possible, you make it less possible by simply shrinking down the quantity or the scope of actions that you would, you know, go forward to take that would end up producing that end result. So I think that's what, that's one of the reasons why thinking big is just so important because how big you think is directly proportional to, to how many possible actions or routes forward you are willing to take, which then goes on to, you know, lead, lead you toward whatever result you end up producing. That makes complete sense. Yeah. This podcast is brought to you by BLDG Active Skin Repair products. From diaper rash to knee scrapes and sunburns, with families, there's always something skin related going on. And Active Skin Repair has a unique solution. They harness the power of the human body by replicating the same molecule your white blood cells produce to create a natural antimicrobial. This fights off foreign organisms like bacteria, fungi, and viruses, and helps support your body's natural healing process of soothing skin irritations. I'm a big fan of anything that works with the body's natural processes, and this is the most natural one I have found. 
It's an all-in-one three ounce solution that you can use in place of all kinds of toxic first aid and sanitizing products like Neosporin, peroxide, and alcohol. And in addition, unlike other plant-based balms, Active Skin Repair's hero ingredient, HOCI, is backed by years of scientific and clinical research using the same FDA-cleared medical-grade molecule used in hospitals worldwide. They produce theirs in California in an ISO-certified clean room using a proprietary formulation to make sure that you get the highest grade product available. I've also found in testing this that my kids really prefer this to any other type of product because it seems much more comfortable and doesn't seem to cause the initial stinging or irritation. So it's been a great product at our home. You can learn more by going to wellnessmama.com forward slash go forward slash active. That's wellnessmama.com forward slash go forward slash active, A-C-T-I-V-E. This podcast is brought to you by Paleo Valley. They have been my go-to source for grass-fed beef sticks for years, and I'm really loving their bone broth protein these days as well. It's made from 100% grass-fed and grass-finished cows that have never been given antibiotics, steroids, or hormones, so those compounds don't end up in the final product. They're also made from bones and not hides. See, many companies use the hides of animals to make protein powders because it's cheaper. And when collagen is sourced from the animal skin, we miss out on the extra nutrients and the restorative benefits of the bones. Another important thing that sets them apart. They are not processed with high heat. And this is important because high heat processing can denature and coagulate the protein, making it harder for the body to absorb and use. Extreme temperatures can also destroy more heat sensitive amino acids and other nutrients or make the protein resistant to our digestive enzymes which decreases absorption. So even if you're taking these, you may not be getting all of the benefit. Paleo Valley also third-party tests their bone broth protein powder for pesticides, herbicides, and heavy metals to make sure that they're safe. And their protein powder does not have any smell or taste. So it's easy to add to just about everything. You can check it out and learn more about this and all of their products by going to paleovalley.com forward slash mama to save 15%. Again, that's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y dot com slash M-A-M-A for 15% off. I think kids also come out of the box naturally thinking big and with a lot of imagination and without the limits that we kind of train into them over time. So I'm thinking as a parent or anybody in education, a big part of that is simply not training them to limit their beliefs and not training them to be cynical about what they can accomplish and just nurturing that natural inherent idea of imagination and belief that we all had as kids that seems to go away a little bit over time unless we're conscious of it. It does. It does. With every year, for, for, for a lot of folks, with every year that goes by, their possibility space for themselves and their life and their business shrinks and gets narrower and narrower and narrower. You know, when you're, when you're a kid, you think you can be an astronaut flying across the galaxies. By the time you're often, for at least for a lot of people, by the time you're in your, your 30s, the, the amount of things that you feel are possible for yourself in your life has shrunk down significantly and it shrinks again by the time you're you know, 40 and 50 and so on. Uh, but you don't need, it doesn't need to shrink. Uh, that's simply you know, a function of, of what you will allow yourself to believe is possible. And anytime we're talking about something, I think it's always important to also consider the flip side and, and to ask the question, are there, is there a dark side of flow to be aware of? Are there any risk associated with the idea of getting into flow more that we need to be cognizant of? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. So one of the, one of the chapters, one of my favorite chapters actually in Stephen's book, The Rise of Superman was called the dark side of flow. And there's definitely, there's a number of risks that need to be associated with it. One is that flow is as I said, autotelic, which means it's, it's a means in and of itself. It is inherently, intrinsically rewarding. And as a result of that, it can be, can be very addictive. So we want more of it. We want to get into that state and we want to maintain that state and we want to heighten the intensity of that state. And one of the ways that people often do that is by pushing the challenge level. Because as I mentioned you know, you, you have to have that sweet spot between challenge and skill. But if you get better at something, then 
you have to increase the challenge to be able to hit the sweet spot for flow. And so one of the ways that shows up in action adventure sport athletes is that they keep taking on bigger and bigger and bigger challenges to be able to get into flow, which unfortunately, as Stephen outlines in The Rise of Superman, very often results in death. And again, to use Laird Hamilton as an example, he was telling us last week that he, he can only get into flow now hydrofoiling pretty much can't get into flow surfing unless the waves are massive because his skill level is so high that if the challenge is not also very high there's going to be a mismatch between the challenge skills level and an inability to get into flow and and that that applies to uh to companies and to to a professional life as well i was mentioning there that one of the ways to get increased access to flow at a later stage when building a business is to increase the challenge level. But there's downsides to that also constantly pushing for more, constantly taking on more risk, constantly striving and pushing and getting trapped in the hedonic treadmill is not necessarily a good thing. Another thing that is something that needs to be watched with flow is mania or hypomania. Hypomania is a mild form of, of, of mania. It's like a, yeah, essentially just a, a less, less extreme form of, of mania, but it can still result in issues from a mental health standpoint. And there are definitely just corollaries between the sort of state flow results in and hypomania that are really important to be aware of. One of the things people often say is that you shouldn't make any lifelong decisions within the two or three weeks of getting back from Burning Man for example. And that's because often people are in this kind of hypomanic state. It's like an altered state. And that that can be the same for flow, getting into an extremely heightened state that is slightly manic within flow and then deciding that you're going to go and, you know, do X, Y, or Z or pull out a huge bank loan or whatever it is when in that, that heightened state uh, can cause real, real issues for, for one's life. And then I think the other thing is, and this relates to the challenge skills balance thing, but what can, what can often happen is that we, we just need excessive levels of stimulation or, or want excessive levels of stimulation to drive ourselves into that peak state all the time. We get uncomfortable not being in a peak optimal state. Um, and that's really important to be aware of because flow, and I'm sure Stephen mentioned this, but flow happens as one part of a four-stage cycle, starting with the, the struggle phase going into the release phase, then the flow state itself, and then the recovery phase. And often the high of flow, that feeling is so compelling that we want to just stay in the flow state itself. But the recovery phase, the come down, so to speak, from a flow state is an incredibly important piece. And resisting that and wanting to just, you know, only be in a flow state can cause, can cause challenges as well and be a little bit of a dark side, I think. Yeah, I'll make sure to link to that podcast as well, because he does walk through the four stages. And I wonder, are there any other ways to counteract the potential for those things? Like I'm thinking, I wonder if maybe like fasting, meditation, things that are on the other extreme and the calming side, does that help balance it out or just leaving in space for recovery without intentionally trying to do these things? Yeah, definitely. The, the recovery is an incredibly important part of the whole picture. The harder and more intensively you recover, the more able you are to drive yourself into flow and achieve you know, optimal states of performance. And in fact, the extent to which you recover is largely the extent to which you can reach a flow state. Uh, most people are in this sort of no man's land where they're not really getting into peak performance and they're not really recovering properly. You want to be extreme about recovery so that you can get extreme results on the flow side of the equation. And an important distinction as well for people is that recovery is distinct from relaxation. Often activities that are relaxing are not very conducive to recovery. And often activities that are extremely conducive to recovery are not relaxing at all. So what what is distinct about recovery is that it's going to give you a neurophysiological shift. It's going to often create a parasympathetic response within the nervous system and downregulate your nervous system, which then also gives you generally a mental shift or a psychological shift in how you're actually feeling. So an example there is an ice bath. 
you know, an ice bath is the furthest thing from relaxing, yet it's incredibly powerful in terms of um, physiological and psychological recovery. Sauna is, is a similar example. You know, foam rolling, um, if you're trying to recover from cognitive exertion, then intense exercise, intense physical exercise is a very, very effective way of recovering, but often that's not relaxing at all. Um, on the contrary, you know, sitting down on the couch and flicking through five or 10 minutes of different Netflix shows is, is, is potentially relaxing, but it's actually not going to recover you very effectively. You're not going to be able to wake up the next morning fresher than you were when you finished work the day before. Um, so yeah, reco recovery is, is, is super important and uh, being willing to push yourself within recovery, which is sort of a paradox, is also really important. People often think that, you know, the pushing or the, the, the work ethic is applicable within the work side of the equation only, but actually the work ethic and the discipline is just as applicable within the recovery side. At the end of an extremely hard work day, the most tempting thing to do often is going to be to veg out and, you know, scroll social media or flick on the TV. But in reality, the, the most effective thing to do when factoring in your overall level of output, including the following day, is going to be something like jumping in a sauna or taking the time to do some yoga or whatever it is, which requires more, more discipline and just more, more exertion. So, yeah, definitely an important piece of it all. Wonderful. And I want to make sure I respect your hard stop at the end of the interview. But uh, last question I love to ask is if there's a book or a number of books that have had a profound impact on your life? And if so, what they are and why? Oh, God, that's a good question. I read uh, so many books that I find it hard to even remember what ones were useful in what way. It's a little bit, I always say now that because of Spotify and the, the release radar and sort of the automated recommendation system it has, I don't even know who I listen to or what music I like anymore because it's just auto-generated for me. And I feel, feel slightly similar with books. I've got the Kindle and Audible and just constantly absorbing all these books. And I, I lose track of what, what one was, what one was what, but um, I'll give you, I'll, yeah, I'll mention one book that I found extremely impactful. Um, it was probably the first self-development book I read and it was called Blink by Matthew Syed. He also wrote Black Box Thinking. And I read it years and years ago when I was a teenager, but it was actually, it was one of those books. There's about, three or four of these books that attempt to myth, myth bust the idea of talent. It was one of those books that, that called talent a myth and said that everything comes from practice and time spent intentionally improving at something. And I found, whether or not that's true, I found that argument to be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly inspiring and motivating. And I remember reading that and intentionally picking arguments with friends at the time to try and convince them that there was no such thing as talent. And the only reason they were great at rugby was because they had, whether they were aware of it or not, accumulated all of these skills and sub skills that resulted in their, their abilities. Uh, but I, I, I just found that mindset shift to be incredibly inspiring. It gave me this sense of agency that, Ability is, is nothing more than the sum total of the work put in or the practice that one has done on a certain thing. So that's one. Perfect place to wrap up and a new recommendation. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. I know you have a deadline to stop and I'm really grateful for your time and for all of this fascinating information today. Thanks, Katie. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you guys, as always, for listening and for sharing your most valuable resources, your time and your energy with us. We're both so grateful that you did. And I hope that you'll join me again on the next episode of the Wellness Mama podcast. If you're enjoying these interviews, would you please take two minutes to leave a rating or review on iTunes for me? Doing this helps more people to find the podcast, which means even more moms and families can benefit from the information. I really appreciate your time. And thanks, as always, for listening.